Welcome to the Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs. I'm Bev Mundell Atherstone. Welcome to the 56th year of SACPA. We're a not-for-profit organization with all the work done by our board members to bring you weekly presentations. It is my pleasure to bring to you today Kevin Van Tegen in How Can We Find More Water? Okay, let's welcome Kevin. Thank you to SACPA for inviting me to speak to you. My name is Kevin Van Tegum. I'm the author of Wild Roses Are Worth It, uh, Heart Waters, the Sources of the Bow River, and a number of other books. Spent my whole life working in landscape ecology and conservation and uh, in the recent years have taken a very active interest in learning more about the hydrology that produces our water. Water is very important to us here in southern Alberta. We, uh, we have two-thirds of Canada's irrigated ir agriculture. Um, it's a hot, dry summers here, and we don't produce a lot of water. Our rivers are very small, so we're high water users with a small supply of water. And of course, things change from year to year. Right now, we are in the middle of a drought. And the big question on a lot of people's minds is, how can we get more water? And it seems like every time we have a drought, it concentrates people's minds to find solutions to the water supply problem. And more often than not, we come up with solutions that aren't solutions. For instance, in 1988, the uh, sorry, 1978, the government government amount announced that they were going to build the um, the Old Man River Dam to uh, basically deal with the drought that we'd experienced earlier in the 80s. Um, that dam got built, and as you can see from these images, it's largely full of silt and doesn't have much water in it because dams don't make water. Dams waste water because they evaporate water into the atmosphere. The only way that a dam can produce water is if the water is already there. So we're in a drought, and as a result, we're looking at empty reservoirs and, uh, and, and worried prospects for the future. The first law of holes is that if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And really, that's probably my message in today's talk. How bad is the situation? Well, here's a image of... Um, Last year's Old Man River flow right near my property, which, uh, which is just north of Cowley on the Old Man River. As you can see, the flood stage of the river hit a month earlier than normal, and then the flows dropped off to, uh, and, and remained below normal for the entire summer. It was a hot, dry summer. It was, the river was low. The river was warm. And um, we were on water rationing and, 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 and drought uh, warnings for most of the latter part of the summer. So that's where we were last year. Now, this suggests that we might be facing an even more challenging year this year. The, the bottom picture is a snow pillow information that measures the snowpack in the headwaters of the Old Man River. And really, that snowpack is what gives us our river water. So snowpack is a pretty good indication of what you can expect in the next few months with river flows. The red line that you can see was last year's snowpack before that dry summer, before the the river went low. And it actually started out above normal because the normal range is in the gray area. So the red line was above normal, then it moved into the into sort of the mid-range, but the melt came off a month early. So all of that snowpack was was pretty much gone before the summer actually even started. And when the snowpack is gone, what, uh, what runs off overland is, is, is out of the province, and what soaks in is all you've got. If you look at the blue line, that's the snowpack so far this winter. And it started out below normal, and it's even further below normal now. So if you think the river was low last year, unless something really turns around with our snowpack, it's going to be a lot worse next year, this year. You know, we get droughts here, but... Um, you can say droughts are normal, uh, and they are. But that doesn't change the fact that they are seriously consequential. And who knows what the future will hold, because the climate, is, as you know, is changing, which probably suggests we're going to be evaporating water faster than we used to, and we may not be able to rely on winter snows as much as we used to. 
So how can we get more water? I guess before I get to that question, let's just do a little bit of a reality check here. Uh, because, you know, um, for some reason, uh, the whole question of climate change is controversial with some people and they don't really want to acknowledge that that's what we're dealing with. So is that, uh, if there is no climate change, do we need to worry? Well, what you're looking at on the bottom of it is a graph that shows the uh, width of tree rings that have been assembled from uh, about 1377 to the to the present um, by a fellow by the name of Dr. Sochin, uh, David Sochin, uh, who's with the um, Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative. And what you can see, if you look at those 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 two arrows on the right, there's an arrow atop that says 1995. Trees really grew well in 1995. They got big growth rings because they got a lot of water, and we got a big flood. Everybody remembers the 1995 flood, when uh, you couldn't you could only see the tops of the cottonwoods in 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 Lethbridge because the rest of the valley was river. The bottom uh, little arrow with a with a blue number beside it is 1982, which was a big drought year. That was a year that people were selling off their cattle because there was nothing left for them to graze in the Porcupine Hills. So the tree rings are telling a true story. They're, they, they're, their growth actually reflects our climate history. And if you cast back further, you can see two boxes that indicate that we've had much, much worse floods than 1995 and floods and droughts as deep as what we had in the, in the mid-'80s, but lasting for as long as 12 years. So even without climate change, we know that we need to prepare for water crises, whether it's too much in the spring or none at all during the summer. The flows in the Old Man River, in the South Saskatchewan River actually, where it, where it leaves the province, have dropped. The natural flows in that river have dropped over the last century by about 12%. But if you look at the little graph on the right, you'll see that really the precipitation on average hasn't changed that much over the same period. So what that says is that we're losing that water to something else. It's not because we're not getting water from the sky. But somewhere or other, that water is not making it down to where people use it. The decrease in total flows is actually being 40% because we divert so much for irrigation. The challenge we have is that we are in a water-consuming region. We are not in a water-generating region. We actually use more water than we produce through most of the, most of the uh, prairies. It's, uh, much of this is what's called Palliser's Triangle. And uh, Palliser's Triangle is noted for, for, for uh, being a, a water-consuming area that uh, is always scarce and sometimes very scarce of water. All of the water that we rely on for our municipal supplies, for our irrigation, for our gardens, comes from a very small piece of landscape along the Continental Divide, which is indicated by the blue oval here. It's from snowpack in the Rocky Mountains and the foothills and the spring rains that fall on the, on, the, on the wet spring soils up there. That's where all the precipitation is. That's where all the water comes from. When it gets down to us, we're the users, but that's the producer region. If you want to get more water, that's where we have to look. Not more dams, not more canals, not, not, not uh, cleverness around cloud seeding like that, but we have to ask ourselves, why is that landscape not delivering as much water as it used to and what can we do to make sure that it delivers as much water at the right season as possible that's the way in which we get more water and so to sort of explore that a bit i guess before i do that i'm just going to point out uh, in this next slide that this is not a surprise to anybody as far back as the palliser expedition and 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 john mccone's travel through uh this region in the, in the late 1800s, the importance of the eastern slopes to, the, to, the, to uh, our water supply was well known. William Pierce, who was the first big uh, bureaucrat out here, that was, he was called the Tsar of the West because he, contr- he controlled a lot of the early land use decisions and the policies about where people would settle and where mining would happen and things like that. He described the eastern slopes as a timbered area lying alongside of a prairie country, hundreds of miles in extent, that forms the watershed for our river systems and points out that water supply is the, the biggest limit that we will have placed on us in terms of the future prospects of the country at that time. 
So he, he even back then, he said, don't settle in the foothills. That's one reason that's all public land. Don't settle in the foothills and the mountains because that landscape is too important for to produce water. Settle out in the plains where you've got a better growing season, but take care of your water supply by taking care of your headwaters landscape. That was also reflected as recently as the 1970s when Peter Lougheed and uh, Peter Lougheed's government passed the Eastern Slopes policy that again said the highest priority in managing our Eastern Slopes is watershed management. And our South Saskatchewan Regional Plan says the very same thing. So it's not like we don't know, as we don't have a policy basis that says our Eastern Slopes are important to us for water. It's just that we've been doing everything we can to ruin them. Uh, Maybe I'm overstating that. But stay with me, because I'm going to explore that a little bit. I think, first of all, we need to take a look at how we get our water. When snow falls in the mountains, it can land on the canopies of trees or can land on the ground. When it lands on the canopy of trees, it's up there in the air, it's exposed to the wind and the sun, and most of the snow that falls in the tree canopy is actually gone. We don't get water from that canopy snow because it just goes back into the air. As much as 60% or more of the snow water that lands in trees is lost to us. The, the, the really valuable snow is the stuff that's on the ground, the snowpack, because it builds up gradually. It doesn't nearly uh, um, uh, evaporate back into the air nearly as fast as it would if it was up in the trees, which might logically tell you that we should get rid of all the trees and then we'd have a lot more snowpack. And in fact, that's what we do in our logging and it's a problem. It's not a solution. I'll get back to that. The snowpack builds up over the winter, and then in the spring it melts. Now, if it's out in the open and exposed to the sun and the wind, it melts fast. The snow in clear cuts uh, can melt up to 50 to 100% times faster than snow that's sheltered by trees, shaded by them, protected from the sun, protected from the warm winds. If it melts fast, it, you know, it, it, some of it will soak in, but a lot of it will melt while the ground is still frozen. It just runs off, goes into the streams, and it's gone. Well, it's not gone. First of all, it ends up in our basements and our streets and our alleys because it hits us in a big flood. The faster the snow melt comes off, the bigger the flood, especially if it's accompanied with rain, which it often is in the spring. If the melt is slow, then the ground has time to warm up, the moisture has time to soak in, and the moisture in the soil has a, has, has a chance to sink in deeper. And so the longer it takes to melt that snow the better it is for our water supply because it generates more groundwater. Groundwater is our friend. Runoff water is our, is not. Runoff water becomes a spring flood and is gone out of the province before we need it. Groundwater is kept cold, it's kept sweet, it's filtered, and it comes out weeks, sometimes months later, in springs that feed our rims, rivers and streams that come to us as water that we at the seasons when we need it. So trees have a big inference, influence on, on our snowpack and, and on our water supply. And you can see it, you know, just driving down one of our back roads here. Here's an illustration that shows how uh, a small windbreak traps snow, shades that snow, and holds onto it. And what do you get on the road? You get an icy patch. And you, this is always a problem. Every time you go past somebody's windbreak, that's where you're going to have the, the, the um, wheel start to skid because that's stays colder and stays wetter and, and icier longer than the rest of the landscape. It's not an accident that we grow windbreaks. We grow them to trap snow and hold it and make sure that it melts slowly and goes into the ground. That's what their function is. Um, and the same thing applies in forestry. When you look at this particular forest, this is a Douglas fir forest in the, in, in the southern Porcupine Hills, you can see there's not much snow under the trees because the snow that fell under the trees is long gone. It's evaporated back into the air. But in between, in the openings amongst the trees, there's snow sitting on the ground and it's still fresh and, and white and, and um, hanging in there. So the best approach to forestry, if we want to maximize our water supply and, and maximize the amount of it that comes to us as groundwater and, and, and summer flows is to leave the forest intact, but put holes in it, put openings in it, is to basically retain the canopy, but create more gaps to trap the snow so that the canopy will protect that snow in the spring and the wind will shake the snow off of the canopy into those openings, but the openings will build up the snowpack that will provide our water supply. 
And there's examples of that, but you won't find those examples in public land because the Alberta government requires the large forestry companies to log in exactly the wrong way if you're concerned about water health. This example is on private land off Highway 22, just north of uh, Lundbrek. It's a private land operator went in there and opened up the forest. Didn't remove it, just opened it. And as you can see, it's full of snow. But it's also full of shade, and the wind and the sun aren't going to be able to move that snow out of there uh, as fast as they would if that was clear-cut. And that's what this is. This is clear-cut. This is Spray Lake Sawmills, now West Fraser, uh, who have the forest management agreement that covers our entire headwaters region for the, for the uh, Old Man, Highwood, and Bow Rivers. This is industrial forestry, and it's what we're doing in, the, in, in, our, in our headwaters. And it's not helping us at all. These big clear cuts, obviously, they're not going to be losing snow to the canopy. They're going to be building a big snowpack. But they're exposed to the sun, they're exposed to the wind, and that means that every spring the, water, the snow comes off sometimes seven to eight days earlier than it would otherwise, and it comes off in a rush. And it often comes off down uh, partially reclaimed logging roads and things like that and take a lot of, it takes a lot of silt with it. So it muddies up the water and creates these big floods. Now, fire can be just as bad as clear cuts, and the loggers will tell you that they, in their logging, they're basically getting rid of the fuel that feeds fires. That's another, uh, another myth. It's not true. Fire burns fine fuels best. That's why we split our wood before we burn it. Logs don't burn very well, but kindling does. When you log an area, when you clear cut it and you leave it exposed to the elements, it, it, it fills with fine fuels that dry out fast because in the summer, it's sitting out there in the baking sun and, and in the wind. And so you get this dense grass, all the debris from the, from the logging operation that carries fire beautifully. That stuff is highly flammable. And of course, around the edges of, the, edges of these clear cuts, this being a windy country, there's always wind-thrown trees that, uh, from the ones that weren't cut that have not been knocked over by the wind. And they carry the fuel, the fire, from this fine fuel up into the canopy of the adjacent forest. So when you look at things like the Lost Creek Fire um, that everybody says was so destructive, uh, well, maybe if we logged, we wouldn't have had it, right? Well, in fact, the Lost Creek Fire burned through previously logged areas, and it burned through them beautifully because that was great fuel for them. So if you want to protect yourself from fire, and if you want to maximize your snowpack, you want to keep your forest intact and moist. And you do that by thinning it, by opening it, by creating gaps in it, so there's less competition amongst the trees for moisture and there's more places to trap the snow. That would be good logging. We don't do good logging. And we pay the consequences in spring floods and lost water in the summer when we need it. And, ironically, in increased fire risk. In a drought year, that fire risk is a serious concern. It's not just the logging, though. Because in order to get those logs out, these guys cut roads. And roads are a real issue. Roads are compacted soil. When the soil is compacted, water won't go through it. So you can have a snow, uh, a snow um, bed sitting on top of one of these roads. When it melts, it's going to run off. It's not going to soak in because that's hard-packed stuff. It's like asphalt, right? Not only is it um, compacted soil, but it's not vegetated. These roads don't have vegetation on them. So this, when you get a spring rainfall... If it hits in the forest, those raindrops get shattered into little bits as they go through the canopy and, and hit the vegetation that's sitting on the surface of the ground, and they hit the ground with a lot less impact. They basically come in wet and, 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 and scattered rather than heavy and, and uh, like little bullets. But on the road, it's different, of course, because it's, it's, it, it hits the road with full impact. And what that does is it jars the soil loose and uh, creates a rapid runoff effect. And these, ra these, these roads are basically like little channels that trap all that surface runoff, take all that silt and run it straight down off the landscape into the rivers. When it goes into the rivers, it creates an instant flood. But also it carries all that sediment. And that sediment is what's clogging the bottom of the Old Man and the St. Mary's and the other ma major on-stream reservoirs that we've got in southern Alberta. Uh, so that increasingly we're not storing water in them anyway. We're storing dirt that eroded from these damaged headwaters and was washed out from the network of roads and motorized trails that we've got all through our headwaters. You can see it at work here. I, I've never quite understood why this particular area was logged. Uh, basically, they cut the trees and left them lying there. 
um, I guess their theory was that they would, the new ones they planted might grow faster. I don't know. But you can see that the road is being left there, and you can see surface water sitting on the top there. That was meant to be groundwater. In a healthy landscape, that water would not be visible. It would be underneath the ground. It would be working its way gradually down to the springs that feed our rivers and streams. Instead, it's running on top of the surface, picking up all that soil that used to grow live vegetation, and running it down into the river fast. And then there's roads, and then there's roads. What you're looking at in this image is a coal exploration road that was left on, on Cabin Ridge in the headwaters of our Old Man River on the North Fork of the Old Man River because of our uh, government's uh, strange excursion into the idea that maybe we should be strip mining our headwaters. So they opened up the headwaters for coal development briefly until uh, you know a massive uprising of Albertans sort of told them that was a bad idea and they backed down. But while the headwaters were open, they leased off these at least off leased out big chunks of our headwaters landscape. And the companies promptly went in and started looking for coal, which they do by driving bulldozer tracks up and down these hills and gouging into the landscape to see what's in there and, and, and drilling boreholes. Well, I think these companies were given some assurances by uh, by the cabinet ministers of the time uh, that they were going to be able to develop their minds, that we would not get in the way. We did, and they had to back out. But they built these roads to, uh, without any real plan to reclaim them, and they haven't been reclaimed. And frankly, at this point, they are unreclaimable because the longer they sit out there, these big bo- piles of bulldozed material that they pushed off the edge of these hills, the longer they're exposed to rain that washes away the fine material. So that now, even if you go in there with a backhoe and pull all this stuff up and try and restore the hillside shape so that the groundwater is working normally again, it won't work because you won't have the fine soil materials. It's all gone. It's in the bottom of the Old Man Reservoir now. All you got is the coarse rocky rubble which, of course, isn't going to hold roots and isn't going to hold vegetation nearly the same degree that it would if it was intact. So we have this big legacy of a bad policy decision made by a government that really wasn't paying attention to its its policy responsibilities there that has added to the, to, to the cumulative effects that are cutting into our water supply. If we, had, if we could do one thing this year that would be of value to us forever for the, for the next century, it would be to get back in there and get these roads pulled back on and, and re- restore those hillsides to a, a semblance of what they were before so that the groundwater is not lost to them. Because that's what's happening. Uh, and, and when you see this groundwater that's been, that's been exposed because of the cut into the hill, um, it's coming to the surface uh, in rainstorms and snowmelt period, it might make it to the river, but a lot of the times it just runs down until it evaporates. So it never even reaches the river. That water is gone. There's a reason we have 12% less natural flow in the Old Man River than we used to, and it, it, that reason involves a sick landscape where water is not even allowed to do what it's meant to do. It's hard to see in this this hillside image beside one of the coal exploration roads, but the whole bottom half of what you see is wet soil. That is the groundwater that was already in the ground leaking out. And it's leaking out because when you cut into a side hill, you create a a, a pressure gradient that allows water to sort of, instead of having to work its way slowly through the soil down to the river, all of a sudden it can escape out the sides of these these side hill cuts. And that's what it does. So you're not just affecting the, the, the surface flow during the snow melt and during the rainstorms. You're actually draining the landscape of the water that's stored there. And remember, fire is not our friend. And that water is coming out of the root zones of these trees. So we're drying out our forests and drying out our landscapes, not just reducing their ability to to provide water to us, but also increasing the risk that they're going to burn. And it gets worse than that, of course, because in the last three decades, motorized off-highway vehicles have been quite popular, become quite popular, and people have gone out into the mountains and the foothills looking for places to, to use them. And not everybody there really cares about the landscape that they're on. They're, they're, they care more about their vehicle and the fun they're having with it. So as you can see in this image, off-roaders have done multiple runs up this hill to the point where they've cut multiple trails up the hill, and each of those trails is cupped out, is hollowed out. The reason it's hollowed out, all that soil is gone. 
it's been exposed to the rain and the elements and it's washed down to the creek and it's gone. So now that so the we're seeing uh, not just individual roads but multiple roads riddling the landscape, draining the the surface water the, the, the surface groundwater and hastening the runoff of our spring melt. Most of the water you hear, see here is, was meant to be groundwater and would have reached that creek weeks or months later, and it would have reached it clear and cold and, un, and, and, and uh, undiminished, and it would have got there when we needed it because we need, the, we need these streams to be flowing at their best in, in the summer. Instead, the whole landscape is being drained by one off-road vehicle trail that, cro- that crosses this creek, which means that the creek is filling with silt, the creek is more flood prone, and in the summer, when we need the water, the water is already gone because it's drained out of the landscape that was supposed to provide it to us. And I have to spend some time on this photograph because it's, it's just it's it, it, it it's so indicative of how, in a landscape that's been dedicated to headwaters protection, we get exactly the wrong effects. The, the 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 image you're looking at this creek is actually flowing down a seismic cut line back in the 1960s and the 1970s we explored for oil and gas in the foothills of the, and and the mountains by cutting straight bulldozed lines and then uh, the en- engineers that went in behind would set off charges uh, of explosive charges and measure on seismographs the echoes coming up out of the earth and that was how they mapped out the old deposits and uh, and and uh, and found the fields that uh, gave this province so much of its early wealth. When they left, they left the seismic lines there. So they had these bulldozed straight lines cutting willy-nilly across the landscape. And it wasn't too bad because although they were compacted and they were open, they did vegetate back in. They got grass cover on them and clover. They they, they didn't come back, you know, really well, but they were, they were on the road to healing. But unfortunately, they became the play places for people with motorized vehicles once off-road vehicles became popular. So this this partially reclaimed seismic line was exposed was the vegetation was killed and the soil was exposed by motorized users uh, for several years, probably a couple of decades before the 2013 flood. The 2013 flood caused no damage to the adjacent forest because when those heavy rains came, they hit the canopy and sh- splattered into mist and came down and hit a vegetated ground with soft, f- poor so- soil and soaked in. But on the clear-cut, on the, not on the clear-cut, but on the seismic line, it was a very different story. On the seismic line, they hit bare dirt and they hit it at full full velocity and they hit it for like seven or eight hours at a very high, high volume and they basically blew it right out. They washed all the soil away and cut this gully in. Now, this water that you see flowing down this this the, the, this um, cut line is not a creek. This is groundwater. It's draining out of the, the landscape. And the whole water table has been lowered by about two meters here. Two meters less storage in this piece of our headwaters reservoir. And just to make uh, the whole thing more ironic, you can see a trail up the left-hand side where the off-roaders are going up the, the cut line anyway. They just found another way up there. So this is happening all through our eastern slopes, foothills, and mountains, on top of logging, on top of the coal fiasco, and all these things collectively combine to reduce the ability of this landscape to trap snow, to move it into groundwater, to hold that groundwater, and to release it in the summer when we need it. It's no wonder that we're getting more frequent spring, flo- intense spring floods and more consequences when these periodic droughts hit us. One last image from the coal road on the, that I photographed on Cabin Ridge showing how the escaped groundwater stagnates, gets trapped, and evaporates into nothing. The irony being that whoever it was that was working on this, this uh, coal road felt that they should bring bottled water up with them for their lunch and leave the uh, litter in these drying out pools in a landscape that produces some of the best water in, 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 in the world when it's healthy. Well, okay, so we have a problem. If we want more water, we could probably stand to start rethinking the ways in which we use the landscape. But there are solutions. 
And it's time to be working on them. We should have been working on the solutions 20, 30, 40 years ago. But if you are, as they say with planting a tree, the best time is 20 years ago, the second best time is today. This is the time that we should be paying attention to our obligations to our own future and to our obligations to the landscape that we're, be- that we're lucky enough to be uh, able to live in by starting to put the eastern slopes back together. And probably the easiest first step is to look at the valleys that no longer have beavers and get beavers back in there. Because beavers are our best friend when it comes to water supply. And they do, they do a lot of work for us, and they do it for free. It doesn't cost us a cent. These dams, this valley that you're looking at here, this 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 wetland, is uh, an empty beaver pond at this point in its history. You can see the willows are growing back around the rim. But this was probably a narrow, incised valley after the glaciers melted. And in the last twelve to 20,000 years, beavers have repeatedly dammed this valley to the point where they trap soil, they've trapped uh, organic material, and they've turned it into this giant sponge so that every spring when the snow melts and the, and, the, and the spring rains come, the water can't escape until it's filled that sponge. And then for the rest of the summer, that sponge is slowly f- feeding water back into the creek, which is c- carrying it down the river, which is carrying it down to where we need it. Not only is it a giant sponge that stores water, but it's awfully hard for water to escape here in a hurry because it has to go through these series of check dams. So beavers both increase our water supply by storing that water in the not in the just the in the dam por- the pond portion of their dam, but also in the soil around it. But they also reduce flood risk because they hold back the spring flows and mean that they can't escape as fast and accumulate in the rivers and become as a, a big a flood as they would otherwise. Even in the winter, they are part of this solution of of creating snowpack because they're in narrow valleys, small valleys. Beaver ponds are generally relatively small in the foothills. And quite often they're shaded by the adjacent hill slopes so that they catch the, the snow that's being blown off the tops of these trees and then they retain it through the winter. Uh, so they're, they're not just capturing runoff, they're actually storing winter snows for us. But a lot of valleys don't actually have beavers anymore because they were trapped out in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And after they were trapped out, those creeks did what creeks do. They blew through the beaver dams eventually, and then they started downcutting and, and, and restoring the valley to the narrow profile that it would have had in the first place. And in doing that, they lower the water table on the floodplain, and that means the willows die. And so we can't just bring beavers back to these valleys now because there's nothing there for them to eat. And to the credit of groups like Cows and Fish and Trout Unlimited, uh, there are now volunteers going up into some of these these, these valleys and creating what they call uh, um, beaver dam surrogates. They're actually creating phony beaver dams, uh, driving piles into the ground and, and piling brush and dirt against the piles so that the water is backed up long enough to saturate the, the valley floor again. And that allows the willows to come back so that in the fullness of time, beavers will take over the job because they'll have a food supply again. Well, I don't know why volunteers are who we have to rely on to restore our water supply when we have people who are making money up there destroying it. The responsibility for cleaning up your mess should lie with the people making the mess. And so I think we really need to, need to ask our question, uh, ask the question of if we want to restore watershed health, what are we asking of the logging companies? What are we asking of the off-road vehicle groups? What are we asking of the people whose activities for better or for worse, uh, not through any ill intent, but just because of the fact that their priorities are different from what they ought, what they really ought to be in this valuable piece of landscape. What should they be giving back, and how could they help? And certainly, restoring beavers is a, is is would be the kind of constructive, positive work that would really start to make a difference in a short period of time. But I really think that, you know, uh, one of the things that we don't talk about often enough is this whole idea of the value of water. You know, we don't sell water, really. We sell water delivery. Uh, you buy the, if you're an irrigating farmer, you buy the delivery of a certain number of acre feet, but you're not actually buying the water. You're, de- you're, de- you're de- buying the service. When you get your water bill from the, from the town, yeah, there's a, a, a small amount based on how much you use. Most of it's based on just the delivery service. And there's a reason that we've always resisted putting a price on water, and it's because it's essential. You, nobody can live without it. It's absolutely essential. So it would really be penalizing people who are uh, poor, who, who who don't have the wherewithal to, to take on additional costs 
uh, and that they can't escape this one because it's water and, and, and they have to have water. But still, when you're doing business planning, when you're doing cost-benefit analysis, you need to price in the costs and the, and, and the, and the benefits of all the th- things that are influenced by your activity. That's one reason that climate change and, and carbon, uh, carbon emissions are priced into the business plans of large oil companies, even when they don't have to pay the full cost. Well, what would it look like if we priced water into the decisions that we make on the landscape? I've got a friend that ranches up in Pekisco Creek. And uh, his name's Gordon Cartwright, and, and he's been involved over the years with various efforts to uh, protect his landscape, his water supply, uh, and, and, and the health of his landscape from various uh, bad ideas that came from the industrial sector, uh, most recently a major pipeline proposal. So he took it upon himself one day to sit down and pencil on the back of an envelope what he thought would be um, a calculation of the value of the water being produced by the watershed that he and his ranching neighbors take such care uh, care of. If you buy water, bottled water, like the the, the, the bottle of water we saw earlier, you're paying $4,400 per cubic meter for that water. $4,400 per cubic meter. So that's what Nestle's is getting. It's a pretty profitable business selling us water in bottles. But of course, you know, it's, it's a ridiculously overpriced if you're, if you're trying to irrigate a farm with it. So what's another way you could look at it? He also looked at, uh, you know, how much water, how much it costs to buy water from the municipality when you go to one of these tanks in, the, in a small town and get water to, in your, uh, divert water into your truck and take it back to water your windbreak or to, to fill your, your uh, watering troughs for your cattle. If you buy that water from the municipality, you'll be paying seven dollars per meter cubed, cubic meter. Well, Gordon used a dollar eighteen per cubic meter, and I asked him why, and he actually couldn't recall why he picked such a low number. But he did want to err on the side of being conservative. Based on a dollar eighteen per cubic meter, the Pekisco Creek watershed produces ninety-four million dollars worth of water every year, and that was the value that he put on. The, the the work that he and his landscape and his rancher neighbors do every year to take care of that watershed and keep it functioning and healthy. Well, you know, the first license that was ever issued for water withdrawal from the Old Man Reservoir was issued actually by the government to itself to evaporate water because that reservoir evaporates 7,820,000 cubic meters of water every year simply by sitting out there in the sun and the wind. That's $9.2 million worth of water lost into the air based on Gordon's calculations. The average annual water yield for the South Saskatchewan River is 7.5 billion cubic meters. Using Gordon's numbers, that's eight hundred, sorry, $8.85 billion worth of water. If we could increase the amount of water in that drainage by not the 12% that we've lost over the last century, but just by 1%, that would be worth $885 billion a year in terms of the value of water priced at that low rate. So that's a pretty darn good return on investment for one or two or three or four million dollars being spent every year to actually improve the water supply. If, it, if you, A lot of people would, would die to have that kind of investment return. It's not just how much more the the value of water uh, in, uh, um, is underestimated, and 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 as a result, we fail to invest in, in in keeping our headwater healthy. There's also the costs that come with flooding. The 2023 flood, the estimated cost of repairs after that was five billion dollars. You know, if you think about if you could have reduced those costs by one percent by reducing the intensity of that flood we would have saved $50 million. You know, there's a lot of things that we could use $50 million for in this province. Cleaning up after flood after flood after flood is sort of, uh, takes you back to that analogy. When you're in a hole, stop digging. Why do we want to keep wasting money on these floods that could be avoided by having healthy headwater landscapes? We can't avoid 
all flooding, but we can at least avoid the intensity of the worst floods by dampening them down and, and, and diverting more of that water into groundwater so that it comes to us when we need it rather than when we don't want it. So if you want to invest in improving our water supply and getting more water, what are some of the things we could do? Well, certainly we need to do wise risk management because we can't avoid the fact that we do live in a landscape where we do get wet years and we do get drought years. So we need to reduce our economic exposure to uh, the risk of running low on water. This is not the time to be radically expanding irrigated acreage. That's like walking out farther on thin ice. Uh, this is the time to hedge our bets by keeping some something in the bank, by, by holding back so that we're ready when drought hits us. It's also not the time to be increasing our clear-cut uh, allocation of lumber to the logging companies by 13%, which is a decision that the, the current government made uh, a couple of years ago. That's just sort of insanity. Uh, why get more aggressive at taking trees out of, the, out of the landscape when those trees have got a critical function providing us with our water security? And of course, we should also be looking at smart measures to re minimize evaporation losses. Uh, you know, it's important now, it'll be even more important if uh, some of the worst scenarios being predicted about climate change come to pass. Things like covering our irrig open, larger irrigation canals with solar panels that generate electricity right near where people use pumps to run water onto crops. It just makes sense to, to do smart things like that. But mostly, we need to look at how we get our headwaters to function to give us the water they used to give in the ways in which we used to get it. One of those involves restoring and revegetating compacted roads and trails. That could have a huge impact in reducing flood risk and in improving groundwater storage. We also need a set of operating ground rules for forest companies operating in the eastern slopes. If we're going to have logging there, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, I think logging companies could actually play a big role in helping us to improve the water capacity of our headwaters, but not if they keep doing what they're doing now, which is the stuff that they do all over the province. We have one set of operating ground rules for logging companies all across this province, but our headwater forests should have their own set, and that should involve no clear cuts, really, no clear cutting, except possibly on some north-facing slopes where they're out of the sun and out of the wind, and a lot more selective logging and, and, and canopy retention logging that creates openings in the forest but leaves the forest. Instead of cutting down the forest and replanting the trees, we need to remove trees and retain the forest. If we do that, we are logging for water. If we don't do that, frankly, we're logging against water. And that's what we're doing right now. So that's one way, another way to invest in the future of our water supply. And of course, restoring beavers and or create those beaver dam analogs in headwaters valleys. Now, I don't know how much flood protection and how much improvement in the, in the summer water supp supply we will get from any of those things. Because frankly, I don't think anybody's really studied them. Because those are questions that for some reason people aren't exploring. They've certainly done a lot of work on how to get more trees out of the landscape. Uh, we've certainly uh, looked at ways in which we can build more trails and roads and, and, and engineer them better. But not into how we can do these things in ways which enhance the water supply rather than... Uh, trying to mitigate the damage to the water supply, which indicates a whole different set of priorities. So there are things we could be doing right now. There are things we should be doing right now. And probably one of the objections to that would be, well, it costs a lot of money to do that. But as I pointed out, if you're actually factoring in the real value of the water that we aren't getting and the real costs of the floods that we're enduring, we can afford that investment. In fact, we'd be stupid not to afford that, afford that investment because it's probably one of the best investments we can make in the future of this province. There's nothing more strategically important to our economy, to our communities, to our environment than water security. That's where we need to be spending our money and the only place that we can get more water is by restoring the health of the headwaters landscape and managing it in such a way that water is always the first thing we think about instead of the last thing. So, how can we get more water without wrecking the place further? It's actually quite simple, by fixing what's already broken. And we know how to do it, but we need to get on with the job. Thank you. 
Okay, now is your chance for the democratic part of SACPA where you can line up and ask any question to your heart's content. The only caveat is we do not want speeches or long stories. So get your question firmly in your mind, come and ask it. If you don't want to come up here, write it on a paper and I'll ask it for you. Okay, thank you very much. Please line up where Knut is standing. And we'll ask our speaker back. Oh yes, please, state your first and last name. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Spearman. So uh, I'm reminded now of uh, a saying they have in Africa. As, as the water hole dries up, the animals look at each other differently. Uh, so th what, what I'm seeing now is many of the municipalities are creating plans uh, to try and ensure they have enough water. Uh, and it almost looks like a little bit of a competition in a way. Uh, so uh, they're recognizing that water levels are lower and they're no longer getting water in some communities, they're trucking water in already. So how do we, uh, how do we work together collectively for the greater good? And uh, in, instead of uh, looking at our own individual needs, uh, there needs to be some parallel courses. And we're, another way to ask that question is, uh, what are the short-term things we could all be doing as communities versus what has to happen long-term in terms of investments? I'm going to answer two questions there because I think there actually were two questions. Um, uh, I'm very much focused on policy type solutions, long-term solutions. For me, these are strategic questions and they, they influence the, the province and the, and the world that we live in and the way in which we live with, the, with each other. And it's really true about the animals looking at each other differently when water gets scarce. Um, these sorts of scarcity is not good for society. It does not bring out the best in us. It brings out, in many cases, the worst in us. Uh, in terms of how do we bring out the best in us, I, I would say our best opportunity is the fact that we have a South Saskatchewan Regional Plan, and it is due to be revised. And it is the re land use plan for the entire South Saskatchewan Basin. It's where we are supposed to look at all the things that are happening there, all the, all the needs that we have that, are, uh, that, that relate to the land use, and say, what are we going to do? Uh, and how are, we going to, how are we going to steer our way into the future, taking all these things into account? That's why we have regional planning. It's, 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 um, I've had some really lively debates over the years with Ted Morton. Uh, we don't see eye to eye on any, anything, except this, because this was his product, was the Alberta land, land use framework and, 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 and regional planning. We need to do more regional planning. So I would suspect maybe a lot of people in this room, probably most of you, weren't even involved in the South Saskatchewan regional plan when it first came out. Well, get involved, because that's where we work these things out long term, and, and it's where we need to have these conversations. In, in terms of what we can do in the short term, it's, it's really all, all around using less water, you know. Um, the, the, the easiest water to get is the water you didn't use for something that you didn't need to do. Um, and there's lots of examples of how we can do that. Um, but I don't like putting it down to individual action. It's an easy out for people that, that, that want to kick policy cans out of the way, is to say, well, it's all about personal responsibility. Yeah, we've all got personal responsibility, and we are all citizens in a society that we elect governments to, 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 to run for us. So we need to hold their feet to the coals, too. So I would say be politically active and don't use much water. Thank you very much. Violet Meekma is my name. I really enjoyed that. It was very informative. I learned a lot. Uh, full disclosure here, I camp in the mountains in the summer, and I quad in the mountains in the summer, and I certainly have seen the erosion that you're talking about on the trails, and uh, of course the coal mining and the impact that all those roads have had. But one thing that we notice is when we hit an area that's clear cut recently, in recent years, we're in British Columbia. So I'm kind of one, maybe we have a very small area that we cover, but can you tell me where the clear cutting is being done now in Alberta that is a concern to us? So, thank you. So um, 
there isn't a, there's hardly any forest in Alberta that isn't covered by a forest management agreement, which basically means a, a, a sort of a privatized operation where a company is given that land base and told, you can have all the trees on this land base, you know, subject to some restrictions, um, but you need to do the planning and you need to, and you need to follow the government's rules, the ground rules that the government sets. Uh, in the case of the old man drainage, it's all uh, uh, now under a for and I blame Ted Martin for this too. Um, it's all under a forest management agreement held by, I believe it's West Fraser now. It was Spray Lake Sawmills, now it's West Fraser. And they are feeding a mill in Cochrane uh, massive numbers of trees uh, on a weekly and monthly basis that they are cutting out of our headwaters. And they are mostly doing it through clear cutting. So if you've been up in the upper old man lately, uh, Cabin Ridge was clear cut a number of years ago. It's partly reforested, but the, the, the flats along the Old Man River, along the main forestry road, were cut just last year. This year, there's a great big cut going in on the upper uh, um, highwood in the, um, I can't remember the name of the, name of the creek. Uh, Lost Creek, uh, if you've heard Lauren Fitch talk about Lost Creek, it was clear cut in 2012. Uh, big clear cuts, and um, and of course, in 2013, we had an inconveniently tie-in flood that didn't do it any good. So uh, um, they move around. Uh, the ground, ground rules mean that you don't, you know, focus your harvest in any single basin at a time because, you know, the, the ground rules do take into account the fact that the, that there are water impacts from logging. So they move around the landscape, and they, and they're logging different areas at different from year to year, and and there's a planning process that goes with it. So. Uh, where are those clear cuts? Um, well, uh, you can find them if you go up the main forestry trunk road north of uh, Coleman. Um, and there's even older ones that have never come back properly. Uh, the whole, most of the upper old man is just a checkerboard of old, really very badly managed clear cuts. There's lots of restoration possibilities in there, um, but, uh, they, uh, but they're just sitting there unrealized because it's not a priority, and it's not something that's required of the, the companies, and in any case, the old logging was done by companies that don't even exist anymore. But it's still our water supply. Somebody's got to deal with this, and it comes back to the governments we elect. Uh, my name's Jim Tagg. I'm going to revisit the what can we do to help uh, question that was asked earlier. And part of the reason is that um, although I'm a big advocate of uh, government uh, acting on behalf of the public good, two words you don't hear much anymore anywhere in the world, and I'm a big advocate too of the bureaucratic state, but the administrative state and the bureaucratic state are under political assault from other partisan groups. But as if you're an individual or a small group of people and you go to the administrative state, they say, we have the expertise, just leave us alone. So I'm gonna go back to what can we do individually? What could a group like this do um, to put, either put the feet to the fire of the administrative state or to do small acts that get some attention? I really like that question. Um, it's really something you see a lot in the forestry sector in particular is that um, uh, we tend to be treated as if we really just don't know as much as they know. And, and you hear that from the industry and you hear it from uh, the administrative state, as you say, and in fact, quite often it's the same people because there's a rotating door where people work in industry and then they come to government and they go back into industry. So it's a very comfortable world they live in because they can all reassure each other about how smart they are but, and, 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 and how un uninformed we are. Um, now, an example where that went sideways was when the, East, when the, uh, when the um, uh, Jason Kenney government opened up the Eastern Slopes for coal mining. And all of a sudden, everybody was up on their hind legs. We had ranchers, we had indigenous people, we had fishermen, we had uh, municipal governments, everybody. Uh, people that didn't even know each other, and only ever talked about each other, were suddenly shoulder to shoulder with each other. And that forced a, a huge and difficult and embarrassing change in, in, in policy direction uh, that probably did not feel too good to f to for some of the administrators in the coal branch in, in, in Alberta and um, energy. So um, organizing around something that is important with people that you don't normally talk to but who also agree it's important 
and being focused on actual solutions that will actually get you somewhere can make a huge difference. Like if we had a, a, a Lethbridge-based, you know, Friends of the Eastern Slopes or a Lethbridge-based uh, water, water users, uh, uh, you know, um, advocacy group that really said, uh, um, don't talk to me about m more dams and canals. I want to talk to you about the source water areas. I want to talk to you about the headwaters and then I'm not going to go away until you've listened. Um, you know, uh, citizen power is amazing when people organize. It's just really hard to get people to organize. Like we all, our world is in our cell phone. Our, our world is in the living room. Uh, or, or like I'm a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a 71 year old baby boomer. I'm just tired of it. And so I just, you know, yeah, you don't want to do stuff, but, but it's when you organize that you, that, that you become a force that uh, the, the vested interests simply cannot uh, ignore or, 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 or um, trivialize. So yeah, um, this is a moment that could, you know, the, the, the opening up the eastern slopes to coal was a moment that woke people up and pulled them together. I would hope that this drought, as it hardens down, becomes another one of those moments. Because if we get it right, we get so much right. And if we get it wrong, we get so much wrong, you know. Yeah, my, my name is Dennis Connolly. And the question I was wondering, with the irrigation, how they spray the, as it goes round, they're spraying all the water up. Uh, I thought they should have hoses every five or six feet going down to ground level. And so as it goes round like that, just only goes to the ground, especially when it's two foot high, the, um, the crop. Uh, how much is wasted? Uh, with the, if it's windy, and, and we do get winds in Lethbridge here. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, I've, I've never seen one. I, I wonder why, I'm not a farmer, why don't they try that? Would that save water? That was a good. That was a good question, and and the truth is that um, the irrigation industry has come a long ways in that direction. You, know, you do see an awful lot of drip irrigation type of or like uh, hanging irrigators rather than the sprinklers, but you know um, some people haven't modernized, uh, um, uh, and 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 um, you know if you've got a water allocation and you're not running out of it, then uh, there's no real motivator to if you're not sending if it doesn't cost you too much. So. You know, I think our biggest opportunity on the conservation side in southern Alberta will always be to look at the irrigation sector because they're the biggest consumptive user of water by far. Um, and they've come a long ways uh, because it's in their own best interest to minimize their use of water because it maximizes their reach. They can open up more acres if they got more water available. But um, there's no question, uh, even today, you go out there, you'll see sprinklers spraying water up into the hot summer sun in the middle of the daytime when nobody should be watering at all. Uh, you know, um, so, so irrigating at night, irrigating more efficiently with, uh, with more directional type of watering, uh, those are things we need to keep on working on because those are the big water savers. But the sa again, like I say, dams only store water if the water is available. You can only save water if water is available. So I'm, 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 um, I'm very cognizant of the fact that um, uh, the irrigation industry has a big role to play in this, but my eyes are solidly fixed on those headwaters because that's where nobody seems to be doing anything uh, towards uh, securing our future water supply. But you're right, I agree with you completely with the point you raised there. Yeah. Hi, Leona Jacobs. So um, I just want to put a plug out there for anybody on Facebook that there's a Facebook group, if you don't already know about it, called Protect Our Mountains and Headwaters. And they were the galvanizing force when we were fighting back on the whole coal mining issue. Um, it's kind of gone into a bit of a lull um, because we haven't had anything to fight for, but this might be a good reason. Um, my actual, um, why I got up here was because it's been revealed just recently and um, we're not, I'm not 100% sure what's going on, but there's something like an order in council that's rescinding the designation of parks in Alberta. And I just wondered kind of what role parks play and um, the pros and cons of that. Well, from a water point of view, uh, parks are, 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 are kind of a nice way to treat the landscape because uh, they automatically come with very few roads, uh, very little motorized activity and they tend to protect vegetation and the vegetation protects the soil and 
traps of snow and so forth. So, so certainly the establishment of the castle parks was all good in terms of our water future. Um, closing parks is not all good, but I, I think the orders in council are mostly around small recreation areas at this point. So uh, I have to admit I'm one of the ones that sort of raised the alarm on that when I was alerted to it. Um, I'm not sure why the government is doing it. Um, uh, you'd think they got burned the first time um, that they tried closing parks. But really, at this point, I haven't heard anything about actual large landscape type of parks being closed. These are the recreation areas that, that, that usually sit around a campground. And um, I have a feeling it's part of a privatization agenda. It's sort of like the political, the way the political winds are blowing right now in, 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 in Edmonton. and. Uh, it's a separate issue, but I don't think it's a water issue, really. It's, it, the scale is just uh, not at that scale. Hi, Kevin. Henning Mundell here. Um, while your emphasis is on the headwaters, we had the question about irrigation. That uh, raises to me the point, do you think we, there's any way to get our, a government to actually charge for the water used in irrigation and not just per area but per actual consumption because the farmers pay for the area they irrigate and so in some crops that are quite responsive okay just put on lots you know that's really actually a good point is that um you know the one of the reasons that i think that we don't uh, we don't pay for water, like we pay for water delivery, like everybody gets their water bill every month, but it's just for the delivery and for the discharge of your sewage and stuff like that. But we're not actually paying for the water we use. It's a, um, there is a metered rate. It's a small part of your bill, and most of your bill is these other services. So uh, the, the reason that we don't ch usually uh, look at pricing, as, uh, actual pricing as a solution on water issues is because of the, uh, mostly social equity issues. Everybody needs water. You can't price poor people out of yet another thing. Um, so so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dicey road that uh, governments are reluctant to go down. But I will tell you, when it comes to the irrigation in, uh, side, that's a place where the solution is, is, is viable. That is a place where you could go because basically once that water is taken out of uh, the river and put into storage and then, and then distributed through canals, it's no longer considered natural water. It's now, it's now a commodity that, that, that there's a finite amount and it's being managed for a specific purpose and you can attach a, a, a charge to that. If we charge more for irrigation water, we'd probably be, um, be really looking at uh, a lot less water going to uh, 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 crops which have low economic value but um, but high price points on the on the on the on the on the, on the, on the um, supermarket shelves. You know, we, we grow a lot of potato chips in southern Alberta. Um, the the world does not necessarily is not necessarily going to end if we grew fewer potato chips. Uh, we grow an awful lot of sugar. Well, there are a lot of things where we're getting too much sugar already. So so you know we could we could be rethinking the crop mix, and one of the ways to drive that rethinking is to actually increase the cost of using water to produce it. And 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 suddenly corn might be less attractive than things that which use less water than corn. And you know um, so yeah, it, it, I, I agree. It would be a great solution. Um, it's just not my topic. <laughs> My name is Mark Gettle. I see a lot of clear cuts around, especially in Western. Okay, especially in uh, uh, the Western Canada, but I don't see very much regrowth. I just wonder: is reforestation uh, band-aided to the uh, companies? And if so, how effective is it? How long does it take a uh, clear cut to become back as a, a productive forest? Well, if you buy into the industrial forest model that the province of Alberta operates under, um, it's actually a success story. It's one thing that we do well. Uh, reforestation standards are, are are pretty rigorous, and they're they're um, they're they're met by the companies, and they're actually monitored by the government. So, um, but the problem is, is that we're reforesting for trees. We're not reforesting for water. And so uh, it's, uh, the, the, the companies are required to meet a free-to-grow standard. I believe it's after 15 years there has to be free-growing trees and canopy closure. But what that means is that you're basically taking that piece of land, Sagabe, and it's saying it's only for lodgepole pine. Because once the canopy is closed, there's not much growing underneath it. Uh, once the canopy is closed, you're getting a lot of canopy snow, which is not ever going to be part of your snowpack. It's no longer water supply. 
And um, those trees are using a lot of water because they're young trees and they're competing with each other. So um, we actually do really good reforestation. We just shouldn't. We, we should do very different reforestation. We should, we should be doing much patchier stuff. And, and, and it shouldn't even be an issue because we should be actually just putting holes in the forest, not removing the whole forest. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, my name is Mary Shillington. Uh, I have a question for all of us. How many of us today had a shower this morning? Today. Because that's something we can individually do. We're not getting all that dirty, probably, because uh, we're not doing soil and stuff. So when I put the plug in the tub and I'm showering, I have half a tub of water. I have it every day. Like, what if we stopped having everyday showers and just had washes? And what would be the, Kevin, what do you anticipate the difference would be that we're individually doing that and probably feeling better? That's a good point. I mean, we could also use public transportation. That could be the test when you sit down beside somebody and they move away, then it's time for your next shower. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, you know, we, we, we all have ways of wasting water. Like, I get a charge out of my wife because she's, you know, I, I talk a lot, but she does stuff. And uh, she actually keeps a, 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 a pail in the bathroom, in the toilet, in the, in, the, in the bathroom. And we're having a shower. She's trapping water in the shower, in the pail to put on her plants. <laughs> she, she's got uh, so many different ways of, of conserving. Yeah. I should have her here doing the talk. Thank you very much, Kevin, for your very informative talk. Uh, my question relates to uh, usage of citizens in Lethbridge. Other than the water that is being used for irrigation, it's not really that big an issue to use more water than you need because it runs back in the river anyway. So. What have you got to say about that, Kevin? I mean, it's, I, not that I'm opposed to using water, or uh, saving water, but reality is that everything runs back in the river except the stuff we use for irrigation. Well, yeah, there's a difference between consumptive use and, and, and other forms of use. Uh, the, the water that we use for car cleaning uh, in our back, uh, you know, behind the garage, or, or the water that we use in our garden is consumptive. It consumed water, it's gone, like it's going to evaporate or it's going to be used by plants. Uh, but most of our domestic use is water that has got a flow through element to it. Like we, we uh, wash our dishes, it goes down the drain, it goes through the sewage treatment plant and back into the stream. Uh, so, um, domestic water use is a place that we are usually hit with restrictions first, uh, and it makes a difference to the municipal uh, government's uh, management of their water supply when it's tight. But on the on the big scale, the, the biggest consumptive user is irrigation, uh, and 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 that's where we have the best potential to to, uh, to find economies that actually matter because that water is used and gone, like it's either evaporated or or used in turned into vegetable matter, which then goes off to market. Um, most domestic water, yeah, any water that goes down your drain is going back to the river. It just, it, it, you know, you used a lot of energy to get to that point because you have to treat the water coming in, you have to treat the water going out, and you have to have infrastructure under the streets and everything else. Uh, this is not, oh, Frank Isaac. Uh, this is not necessarily a question, but a, an idea where, if you have a home sprinkler system, you may want to install a home sprinkler system that has got AI as part of it. There's smart sprinkler systems now that will water based on your local forecast. So if it's gonna rain, it's gonna cut out. If it's you know gonna be dry, then it will operate, that kind of thing. And I'd just like to thank you for this talk. I, I worked at one time with the PFRA. I don't know whether you're familiar with them, but they were responsible for regulating dams and dugouts in the southern region from the, uh, from the watershed. And we did detailed diagrams and everything on farmers' um, dugouts and dams and knew exactly how much was coming out, except we worked too slow, federal government, sorry. Um, 
but they had a really good handle on how much was coming through. You've got that information now. I don't know whether anybody wants to know about that, but there's stream flow measurements that are available. And to give you an idea on irrigation, the Belly River in the summer flows at a rate of around two cubic meters per second. Okay, that would be how many? $4,400 times? Um, <laughs> but the canal that services from Waterton all the way along into the belly and then it's extracted from the belly again and goes down to the St. Mary's, that has a flow rate of 60 cubic meters a second. So the release on the Belly River is almost like uh, one thirtieth of what's being used for irrigation. Anyway, I just thought I'd say that. One last point. Well, maybe I'll just wrap up with one last point then, because I think we're at the uh, coming to the end here. But um, uh, there's a there's an old joke about uh, you know it shows a bunch of people watching a climate scientist and one is muttering to the other saying, well, what if we make all these changes and make it a better world and it all proves to have been a big big uh, fraud. And I think there's a, that point to be made is if we, if we manage our headwaters well for water, we are automatically managing them well for trout fishing, we're managing them well for wildlife, we're managing them well for recreation, we're managing them well for our own spirits. So there's nothing to be lost by getting it right in the headwaters. There's everything to be lost by getting it wrong. Um, I would really hope that uh, if there's one thing that people do after this, it's just give your MLA a call and remind them of that. Um, this needs to be on the radar screen much more than it is. Uh, you can do all the conservation in the world that you want uh, to reduce your water use, but if the water isn't there, you've, you've already messed up. We need to get uh, far more attention on our water producing areas and, and on managing them well and properly and strategically. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin.